Brando is obviously ultimate legend, Apocalypse Now, Godfather, what have you, and I stumbled across this one with no expectations of what it was about. It's just so insightful to watch someone be so established in his career at that point and to be taking such huge risks. Let's, let's just look at each other. I think it was just like incredible to see someone at such power and stature on screen do something in his sort of most vulnerable state. It felt empowering in a way. He's like a grouch throughout the whole movie as well. I mean, he's not attractive to look at, he doesn't sound good. And I still find him to be the most interesting actor of all time. I mean, even, I'm thinking of great actors like Marlon Brando, for as you know, masculine as he was, definitely had a feminine side that came out in most of his roles, I think, you know, even a role like Last Tango in Paris, in which he's this man who's, you know, seducing this young woman and says these macho things and does these sort of bullish sexually aggressive behavior, but there's something about, well, obviously, emotionally, that character has a very strong feminine side. He just had that quality, you know, other actor, you know, Montgomery Clift. I think the best actors have that, you know, Christopher Walken, extraterrestrial <laughs> feminine side, I don't know. Working with Brando, what was that like for a young guy? Well, when you think of growing up with the image of Brando as your sort of source of inspiration, because I remember seeing him in a movie when I was a 16, and uh, I went in into this movie house, and I saw On the Waterfront. I was alone. And I had seen a member of the wedding came first with Julie Harris at the waters. It was a great movie. She was great. In it. But it was, you know, and then I saw this movie. And those days, you, these two, two features, two movies. So I'm sitting there, and this movie comes on, on the waterfront. And I'm just, you know, I'm just locked, because it had the great Kazan directing it. It's over, and I just sat there, did not move. Sat through the whole member of the wedding movie again, just to see Waterfront again. So that's how it impacted me. And it, it, it truly, it, it, it it, it, it's, it was a, you know, today when you tell young people today about it, the response isn't quite the same, but you have to understand, this was in that period, it was a revelation, it was a breakthrough. His acting on screen was different than anything we'd all seen. So it was a, so what? playing with him in the movie, what was I'll that get like? to that answer. It was, it was, it was a little, Nervous? Uh, a little, a little, a little unnerving, and you know you don't know. And 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 Marlon would play that a little bit. You know he was he was always he was he Playful. was hard. yeah. But he was so good to me. He was so sensitive to the condition that I because I was in a precarious condition to say the least because they were going to let me go. I think they were going to let you go. Yeah. What about Brando? Ah, what about Brando? There's a lot about. Brando. First time I saw him, he went on as an understudy in what was the final performance of quite a short run, I think, of, of Catherine Cornell in Antigone, a uh, version by Anouy, and uh, directed by her husband, Guthrie McClinton. And uh, the man who usually played the messenger on this one night alone was playing the chorus, and the understudy was playing the messenger. And I went to see this, and this fellow came on the stage. And then I, I can only say, he, he simply set it alight. And it was Brandon. First time I'd ever seen him. I think it was the first time anybody had ever seen him. And very shortly after that, his qualities were discovered, needless to, to say. I mean, they have a terrific system of scouts for good qualities. And he, he was palpably a great star in the, in the making. And he has, um, he has, it's a dangerous word, I think, to use to do with our work, because I don't really like the word genius applied to the theater. I don't think the theater can quite cope with genius. I think it's too practicable a business. I think, if anything, the height of um, ambition should be to have a genius for practicability. But Marlon has the sort of genius, I think, 
that is able to play a genius. I mean, it's a, his Napoleon, I think, was immeasurably the best effort Napoleon that I think I've ever seen. And it was simply marvelous, simply because of his own particular quality of being so easy, so easily bringing a sense of genius to a character who was a genius. And also, he's, um, he's got an astonishing gift. I, I, I think he's a very, very remarkable actor. It's not always completely controlled, but uh, on the movies, of course, he, he learns to be controlled. Actually, he wouldn't like, he'd hate to be called a technician, I'm sure, but he is one, a great technician. Can you, in two minutes, explain how your feelings must have been hurt when some nobody got a part you wanted in some obscure thing called Truck Line Cafe? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I always think <laughs> when I'm on here. Ask a question. No, as a matter of fact, Truck Line Cafe, I, ha I was dying to play that part. A play? A play on Broadway. I didn't get the part. I went to see the opening night, and I saw this guy on the stage with, in my part mumbling and mumbling. And I thought, oh my God, how much better I would be in that part. And then finally, in the third act, he erupted and electrified the audience. Yeah. And I looked in the program, who's that guy? Marlon Brando. Well, they'll have to change that name. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he was excellent. Yeah, yeah. S somebody said that it w almost gave the actress who played with a nervous breakdown because it was so electrifying to be yeah, on the stage yeah. with him. He, he was, yeah. and, and that was his technique. He would do almost nothing, 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 and suddenly Bang. explode. Yeah. He, he was, and, but he has ruined more actors because people try to imitate that style and they can't. It did kind of give birth to a school of acting and That's some right. of the people who tried to imitate it also happened to have talent, I guess. But, uh, uh, is it safe to say we would not have had Newman and Jimmy Dean and certain people if Brando hadn't made it um, open the door to a different kind well, of acting? Well, possibly, but he also opened the door to a lot of bad acting because you only get those actors who, well, I don't, f why should I go from here to there I don't f feel like it. it. Doesn't motivate me. The guy said, "You go from here to there because you're paid to go from here to there. You just find a reason to go there." Yeah. You no, know, that sort of silly type of acting. No, I think uh, Marlon introduced more bad actors because they tried to imitate what, which was very unique and original to him. Sure. Are you guys friends at all? No. I mean, mm -hmm. I I've met him briefly. No, I don't know him at all. But not enemies. No. Not at all. No. But, with that Douglas delivery, the way you said no, I, there was so much power behind it that I thought maybe you were emphatically not friends, not that at all. No, That's not right. at all. I mean, yeah. as a, from what little I know about him, uh, as an actor, I admire him. Yeah. Uh, as a person, I don't know enough about him. I don't know, you know, where really where yeah. he's at. Do you think, do you buy the idea that... When I was in high school, and I went to a Catholic girls' high school, so there wasn't any opportunity for real male-female contact, my friends and I fantasized about someday meeting uh, Marlon Brando. And uh, we would write these scenarios about how we would meet and what he would say and what we would do and how we would finally find each other mm -hmm. entwined. And uh, one year, we all piled into my friend Didi Savoya's De Soto, Brown De Soto, and we drove up Laurel Canyon because we had just found out where he lived, and we waited there every weekend, every Friday, every Saturday night, waiting for him to come out, and mm -hmm. we never saw him, uh, to our knowledge. Mm -hmm. We were about to give it up. We were about to just, you know, go home and spend normal weekends. When one evening, a guy with a gray hair and a limp and a mustache came out, and we knew that it was Brando. He got in a car. Was he wearing a disguise? He must have been wearing a disguise. No, that was Brando. <laughs> yes, he was wearing a disguise. <laughs> well, I thought maybe you were stalking him so long, this is like two years ago. Oh, yeah, 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 no, 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 no. So we- Still outside, still a DeSoto. A 70-year-old Marlon Brando leaves. <laughs> he was the best looking thing ever. God, he was gorgeous in his mm -hmm. youth. Anyway, we followed him down Mulholland Drive until we got to Coldwater Canyon, and there was, I think there still is a kind of a wide, sort of parking area, and he pulled in and he beckoned for us to, to follow. And he got out of the car and started walking to us, mm -hmm. looking straight at us, and I know he was looking at me. <laughs> uh, and the mustache was gone and the wig and mm -hmm. the limp was gone and he came over and he said, now surely you girls could find something better to do up here on Mulholland Drive. Mm -hmm. No more. You go on, get away from me. Mm -hmm. And he sauntered back into his car and drove off. Well, uh, it took me about a year to take a full breath 
again after that experience. That's a long and time. all the kids. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, did you ever see him later on? Yeah, yeah. Years, uh, years later, long after I had done the Dick Van Dyke show and then we were already doing the Mary Tyler Moore show, and I was introduced to him in the VIP lounge at the airport, and he was sitting kind of sitting on his spine reading a magazine and somebody said, um, Mr. Brando, I'd like you to meet Miss Moore. And he looked up and kind of grunted his acknowledgement. And that was bad enough. But when we got onto the plane, we'd been in flight for about a half hour. He mm. came over to me and said, I'm sorry, I didn't realize who you were. Now that disappointed me even further. Mm -hmm. But the worst part was Cause... that he didn't remember me from Mulholland Drive. <laughs> Did you say it was me and the DeSoto? No, no, I wasn't going to get down <laughs> on my knees and grovel uh -huh. for his attention. But Marlon, if you're out there. Oh, he watches. You're watching. He watches regularly. He's eating Hagen dazs right now and watching the show. <laughs> you um, may want to cut back on that, sweetheart. <laughs> no, he's happier this way. Uh... And do you, do you have memories of Marlon Brando? I have a great, great story about Marlon. When he came, he went and introduced himself to everybody the first day he worked, but I wasn't there. He also threw a party, and at the party he had a cover band, a great Filipino cover band that was covering the top, you know, 40 music in the 70s. And uh, he had a magician, and the magician was performing, and I was sitting there watching, and he saw me and called me over, and I went to sit next to him, and I'm enraptured with this magician and he produced a bird out of some handkerchiefs like they do right and i was dazzled at 14 right right up close with the you know bird ah i was like oh wow how? and i said how did he do that to marlon and he leaned in and he said and bull <laughs> classic absolute Brando was brilliant in that. Yeah, yeah, he was great to work with. We all, we all. We all what? We all, it was, at one time, I think he, probably for most American actors, younger, he was like a hero, very much so, yeah. You know, we, we all respected him. Yeah. D disappointed in the way it turned out, in the sense that he's. Well, I mean, he wasted a wonderful talent by, you know, getting fat and minimizing the, uh, how, uh, you know, the business and wouldn't let his children, I guess that's what I've heard saying that it's not a good profession. I think it's a fine profession to be an actor. What's wrong with it? You know, you bring joy to other people. You, you, you know, it's, it's nice. I think a lot of people uh, assume that Marlon Brando was a very kind of serious figure, but the two of you seem to have a lot of fun on set. A lot of fun, especially with Jimmy Kahn. Jimmy is a, he, he and Bill Murray, the two funniest guys I ever worked with. And Jimmy would tell a joke. It would take Brando three seconds to catch on. <laughs> and he would go, uh, like that. <laughs> We had great times, yeah. I know what you. I know where you're heading. Well, because you did about the mooning. Yeah, because we all moon. Believe me, and you know to keep the set, you know, fun. Yeah. So you want to? I'll tell you the best story of all. Okay. Go. This is absolute true story. We're in Staten Island at the wedding, and Brando. He gave out belts at the end of championship belts for mooning. He went for his belt. I went for my belt. And, and Copeland said, oh, "Come on now, there's women and children. And don't." But he kept going. I kept going. We mooned each other, mooned everybody. Some woman turned to me and said, Mr. Duvall, you, you're fine. But she turned to her friend and said, but did you catch the balls on that Brando? She <laughs> said. True story. What I had read over the years that he, during The Godfather, Brando would just have his lines taped up. So he was basically. Just reading them off yeah, the wall. When, when he had the big scene with Pacino in the garden, uh, he leaned back into his lines on a tree. <laughs> he had them on a tree. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and then he'd have his lines here, and we'd take them away and put in a, a, a wedding invitation. And then he'd have to cut. <laughs> well, I have a photo. Yeah. This is a real photo. Yeah. We did not mock this up. This is you doing a scene with Rando, and you have to hold the, yeah. the lines on your chest. Exactly. Exactly right. Yeah. It was great. Brando, you know, he, it was terrific. So one day, Brando said, you know, can I have a three, uh, three minutes? And then he, he after Sonny died, he, he got prepared himself emotionally, had a great scene. A week later, uh, Jimmy Kahn with his shoulder said, uh, Francis, could Bobby have a moment? And I go like this. Action, I just walk across the stage. Brando gave me a dirty look, you know. <laughs> You know, so we had a lot of fun. But it was very therapeutic 
to do crazy stuff like that, mooning yeah. each other and stuff like that. Because it, <laughs> it kept, it kept the, everything kind of... Let me say roll it first, Freddie. Make it a little easier. 160. Thank you. Action. Charlie, Charlie. You made me die for the short on money, Charlie, and... I mean... I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody. Instead of a bum, which is what I am. It was you, Charlie. Charlie, get your hand off my leg. Well, I Charlie, told him I didn't see you. I told him I didn't see you. The worst imitation I... <laughs> okay, cut. I'm I gonna got... send that what is it like for you, a young guy, great role for you to work with Brando. It was Pacino's, Pacino was scared to death, he told me. But that. we will. I mean, listen, anybody that tells you that, that was my age or, you know, or even a little older, they say that, that Brando didn't, you know, didn't mean anything or wasn't the most, you know, looked up to guy, you know, when we were working and acting. They're lying. You know, he was, he was the guy. So what was it like to work with him? Oh, uh, he was a riot. I mean, yeah, I, I had more fun I with well. him. And anything I said, for some reason, he started laughing at me. In the middle of a scene, he just started laughing. I'd call him on the phone, and go, oh, and he'd hang up. He just started laughing. So we had a great time. But the first, you know, when I first met him, it was, you know, I remember we had this, uh, Francis, for the first reading, we took this big restaurant up in the Bronx, had a big spread, all Italian food. It was like a dinner, and we read, you know. So Al, myself, Duval, and... <laughs> And Brandon with the head of the table, and all the way down the end of the table was Francis and every all the other characters, you know, and Sterling Hayden was all the way down. And Francis, you can see, we opened the book, we started to read, and all you'd hear, oh, Sonny, you go. <laughs> and I go, I don't know, Dad, you know. And Al go, you know, Sonny, and you can see Francis starting to lean forward. He couldn't hear a friggin' word for like the first half hour. I don't know. He that. found that. Role. And then all of a sudden, the Sterling Hayden had a line. Hey, why don't you go to that? Everybody just. It was, it was magical. It wasn't. You didn't talk acting stuff with him. He'd come in and go, huh. And that meant, where is the shot? And, and, <laughs> and, and uh, he, he. And I would work with him through props. I would put little salami out, or, or, I, would t or I would take a cat and just put. But not words. I would never talk about acting stuff. He would hate it if I talked about, you know, kind of acting talk. But I always worked with props and, you know, kind of offered him things that might help him in his... Uh, but he was a man of incredible intelligence, aside from acting, just as a, as a human being, what he was interested in, what he talked about, what he observed. He was pretty remarkable. But no, I've had the blessing of working with great actors, and that's always been a big um, high point for me. I, I, I can't think of any actor that I really didn't get along with. The studio didn't want Brando. And oh no, they, 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 I was told by the president of Paramount Pictures, Francis, Marlon Brando will not appear in this movie and I forbid you as president of Paramount to bring his name up again. <laughs> and at which time I fell on the floor in a faint and I like had a, you know, I did it deliberately, and they said, what? I said, well, if I can't even talk about it, then how, what kind of director am I? He's okay, you can talk about it. <laughs> and then they said to me, finally, okay, we give you three conditions for Brando. One, he does the film for free. <laughs> Two, he does a screen test. And three, he puts up a million dollar bond, so if any misbehaving on the set happens, he is underwritten, he is under... I said, I accept. <laughs> so that's what I had. I had that, uh, he had to do it for nothing. He had to do a screen test. How was I gonna get Mullenbrand to do a screen test? And he had to put up a bond. So I went, I talked to Brando. I didn't know Brando, but you know, I think he was pretty down and out. He had been in a film called Quemada, Burn, which by Ponte Corvo who made the great Battle of Algiers. And he was like so not in favor that they really thought that if he were in the movie, it would be worse than if an unknown were in the movie. So with Brando, I talked to him knowing he was an actor. I said, you know, I said, you're playing an Italian. Maybe you would like to fool around a little and improvise some things 
to see if you could get the essence of an Italian, you know, he was only 47 years old, and, and the godfather is in his 60s. So he, on the phone, I think he said yes, he, he would do that. And I made a date with him to go to his house uh, and, and, and shoot a little, uh, and do a little improvisation. So I got there very early with two or three of my friends from San Francisco, and they were like ninjas. I said, Marlon Brando does not like loud noise. I had heard that. He wears even earplugs. And so I want no one to make noise. We're going to go there and we'll do hand signals like ninja, <laughs> set up the camera, and be ready for him. So we went to his house there on Mulholland Drive, and uh, it was early. He wasn't up. The maid was there with this beautiful little baby, about one or two years old, I remember. And uh, we set up our cameras, and I had a little, in those days, little Sony Handycam that I had with me that was new at the time. And uh, sure enough, there's a rumble, and he's going to come, and the door opens, and out walks this beautiful man with long blonde hair and a Japanese robe, and I'm shooting him. And I say, good morning, and uh, you know? <laughs> and and uh, he, he, you know, he was as sharp as the tack. He knew everything. He looked around, he saw the ninjas, and he knew I was filming him. This was quote, the screen test. But I had brought like some sazich and some provolone and some uh, Toscano cigars and I had put these props around and he came out and he looked at all this and he figured out what was going on and he took his hair and he did his hair up. He had very long blonde hair and he did it up in a kind of thing himself in the back and he took shoe polish and he, he made it black and then he put on a shirt, and he remember him saying, hey, those guys, the, the lapel has always got a crooked part, you know. And he did that, he made the lapel, and he started to do that. And then he said, you know, he, he was shot in the throat. In the book, he was shot in the throat. So he, he talks like that, maybe. And I said, yeah, you know, I'm filming. <laughs> and then he said, he should look like a bull, bulldog. And he took some Kleenex, and he put the Kleenex, uh -huh, uh -huh, like that. And then he started like acting, but not saying anything. And it was in his house. And, and I'm shooting, and we're all shooting, and he starts going. <laughs> and the phone rings. His phone rings over here. I don't know who was calling him, but he goes. <laughs> so at any rate, it was a miraculous transformation. It was the birth of that character. So I figured I was going to play my cards. I wasn't going to show it to the president of Paramount Pictures. I went to New York with the videotape, and I went to the office of Gulf and Western. Charlie Bluthorn was the head of the company, and he was the big boss. And I knocked on his office. I had set up a tape recorder in the conference room near his office. And I said to him, Mr. does Mr. Bluthorn have five minutes that I could show him something? And, and, and he knew me. I mean... Charlie Bluthorn, uh, it was Church of England, but he had a Viennese accent, and he talked like, Francis, what are you doing, you crazy Francis? <laughs> so he sees me, and he says, well, what is it? I said, Charlie, could I just show you something? And he comes out, and he looks. I turn on the video thing, and there is this guy with blonde hair, and Charlie Bluthorn said, no, no, absolutely. That's incredible. <laughs> And, I, and when he said, that's incredible, and it was incredible, he, I knew that if Charlie Bluthorn okayed it, then it would okay, and that's how he got the part. They forgot about the million dollar bond, but they didn't hardly pay him anything. They paid him like $120,000. In fact, and the big thing with Brando, you know, Brando was hired for three weeks, a million dollars a week, and he showed up, as you know, allegedly very, very big, so I didn't know how to costume him. I said, well, they don't make Green Beret uniforms in size XXXXX. <laughs> so how am I, uh, you know, how am I going to dress him? And, uh, and then he wanted to talk, and, we, and he's such a genius. He's talking about termites and the, the so on. And meanwhile, I'm thinking, my God, you know, I have three weeks, five-day weeks with him, and, he, and his contract was at 5 o'clock he left. And I know what he's doing, the son of a gun. He's going to stall the whole three weeks. I'm going to have to pay him another three weeks. So finally, I said to him, you know, I think we ought to do Kurtz uh, like it is in the book. Uh, in fact, he didn't want the character to be called Kurtz. He wanted, he, he wanted it to have a lovely name like Lely. So in the movie, it's all Lely, and we had to dub him into Kurtz because everyone was Lely. Because he thought it was Lely. It's like, la, la. At any rate, I said to him, Marlon, what if we just 
do it like Kurtz, and you know, Kurtz is described as having almost a skull-like head, bald and stuff. And he said, no, 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 it won't work. So I said, yeah, well, okay. So then on the Friday, which was a week of no shooting, on the Friday morning, he shows up and his head is bald. And I said, Marlon, I thought you said it wouldn't work. He said, well, he said, I lied when I said I read the book. I had never read the book. I read it last night. <laughs>
Well, it's almost a love scene between two brothers. I don't mean sexually, but it's just there is such uh, a feeling of simpatico between the two. Even though one is doing something wrong, it's still your brother. And he looks at me and I'm still his brother. And that added a certain compassion and intensity, I think. Marvelous. He didn't live up to his lousy publicity. I mean, everybody sort of comes and this is, you know, now this is like a tidal wave is coming and everyone, the, the earth trembles when Brando's approaching. Nothing at all. I, the first day of work, you know, I was, I was there and I thought, how am I going to meet this man? I don't want to just sort of bump into him in the hall and say, oh, hi, Marlon, how are you doing? You know, um, I, I, I didn't know how it was going to happen, so I just decided to sort of sit down and relax and do what was going on. He came straight over to my chair. He walked on the set, came straight over to my chair and said, hello. I'm Marlon. I've heard so much about your screen test. I'm looking forward to working with you, and good luck. I went back to my dressing room. There was champagne and caviar from Fortnum and Mason's, a handwritten note saying, I wish you the best of luck now and in the rest of your career. He invited me out to go over to his house for dinner, out to trance, and he had two pieces of advice. He said, first of all, this is your movie, and take it, which I think is damn nice coming from somebody who's got top billing. And he also said, don't kill yourself doing the stunts. Don't be a hero. And I said, that's a little strange. I just got hired to play a hero. And he said, listen, when I was your age, they hired me to do Viva Zapata, in which uh, I was to ride a bucking bronco. And I said, listen, no problem, bring on the horse, whatever. Okay, so they bring on this absolutely incredible, wild bucking bronco, never been ridden before. They put a cinch on him, the horse is going berserk. Marlon gets on the, on the horse, two, two seconds and he's on his head in the dirt, you know, just complete wipeout. Picks himself up and says, okay, bring on the other horse. Now the other horse, with a sawhorse, <laughs> with a piece of wood put between it on the back of a trunk, and he just sat there and did this, and so much for stunts, you know, he did so much, so much for being a hero. Uh, We've had two other people on the show who've worked with Marlon Brando, and I know you worked with him for a few days, mm. and uh, anything interesting come of that uh, relationship? Um, I, I must say, I don't, I don't say this to be vicious, but I don't worship at the altar of Marlon Brando, because I feel that He's, he's copped out in a certain way. He's no longer in the leadership position that he could be. He could really be inspiring a whole generation of actors and by continuing to work. But what happened is the press loved him, whether he was good, bad, or indifferent, mm -hmm. where people thought he was this sort of institution no matter what he did. So he doesn't care anymore. And I just think it would be sad to be 53, whatever he is, and not give a damn, that's all. I just think it's too bad that the man has kind of been forced into that hostility. Um, that's, but you wouldn't, well, he's here tonight, Chris, and, <laughs> um, um, I don't care, and listen, that's not something, that's something that I would say to him as well, I don't, I don't want to be accused of talking out of school, you know, okay. but he could be a real leader for, for us. Yeah. Was it in, exciting to work with him, though? Not really, no. <laughs> no. I had a wonderful time, but the man didn't care, I'm sorry, he just, you know, took the two million and ran, you know? Yeah. Hmm. So, uh, I just still care. I'm a real beginner and I just care so much that it hurts when someone's phoning it in. Yeah. Uh, he is a wonderful actor. He is a brilliant man. But at this moment, he just isn't uh, motivated. That's all I mean to say. What was Marlon Brando like? Oh, he was a gas man. He yeah. was, there was no one like him. Uh, we, uh, uh, I got a call one day. I was in L.A. I live in L.A. now. I wasn't living there then. But I was in L.A. broadcasting, and the producer called and said, guess who's going to do your show? Marlon Brando. He's going to do one interview. He's going to do your show. And he wants to meet you. He'll be calling you. Yeah. So I'm in the hotel room, and uh, the phone rings, and I say hello. And uh, the voice said, Larry's Marlon. And I said, Marlon who? <laughs> <laughs> and Because there was Marlon Fitzwater, who was the presidential press secretary. He yeah. says, uh, Brando. He says, uh, you want to come up to the house, have lunch? And, We'll talk about the interview. He said, okay, I'll send a car for you. So I went down in front of the wheelchair, and the car pulled up, and it was Brando driving. Wow. And the the doorman at the wheelchair said, I'm seeing I don't believe it. I see this. I don't believe it. And we drove around Beverly Hills singing songs. Wow. Went up to his house, had lunch, and uh, a week later, we did the show from his house. He did his own makeup. He served champagne mm -hmm. to the crew. We had a great, and we did an hour and a half. He was a brilliant, marvelous guy. There was nothing in the house that told you he was an actor. Yeah. No Oscars, no nothing, no pictures of Not him. That's so interesting. Um, 
He told me if someone would pull up to this house and leave me $5 million twice a year, I'll never act again. Just just give me the money. Well, yeah, wow. So I say that same yeah, thing. Was, <laughs> Every morning I say that he same was, thing. He was, uh, <laughs> he was a very special guy. And then at the end of the interview, and this went viral everywhere, he uh, kissed me on the lips. Yeah. And uh, I always like to say I've never been kissed on the lips by a man. Uh-huh. In my life, you know, and uh, I can't stop thinking about him. <laughs> <laughs>
and he had a great time doing it, and he just, the way he wanted to do it, that's fine. But when we talked on the phone, we talked intimate things, many intimate things, and he called me about three weeks before he died, and he said, Carl, I've fallen five times, and I don't know what's wrong. I said, don't talk to me, call to a doctor. He said, I don't want to go to a doctor. Well, have the doctor come to you. No, I said, I'm coming over, Marlon. He said, Carl, don't come over. There's nothing you can do. I said, okay, if that's what you want. Do you have any? He said, I've got the gal here. She takes care of me beautifully. Everything is fine. And that was it. He was the man that I, I cherished and I loved. Never got to see much of. And at the memorial especially, everybody was talking about Marlon and what he did away from the screen and what he did away from the acting. And I wasn't supposed to talk, but I couldn't take it. And I talked about Marlon the actor, because that's what he was. He was an actor. And I think there are many times when his private life became more important than his theatrical life. That was the terrible part of it. The papers latched onto him, and he was the front page of papers for his, most of his life. And uh, I think he hated that. But that's the way he was. Thank you.